If there's any better day, I think, than today for us to honor fathers, it is on Father's Day. I think many folk um, really appreciate these days because they are days that we can really just accentuate certain aspects of our Christian life, draw our minds to it, and ask the hard question, just how far and how well are we growing in these areas? I'd like to welcome a friend of mine, Kwame. Kwame Ahua Ofe, and it's wonderful having you. We've been in correspondence for quite a while. He's from Rola Church of Christ in Missouri, and it's really wonderful having you here. He's out here on academic reasons, and uh, we pray God will bless your time with us, and that you will take our greetings back to the church when you get there. Welcome. Please keep the text open that you have at Ephesians chapter 6. Our culture, without a doubt has been smudged with the bad examples of fatherhood. It also has been altered in such a way that you will find, if you do dwell in those areas, that there is a huge cry out against patriarchy. Now, if you don't understand what it is and what it basically means, is that people are saying all over the world that the reason we have such abuse of women is because of our view that men are the head of their households. In fact, that men are the reason why this world looks the way that it is. And every single time I've been to an academic discussion, there has been this kind of outcry against patriarchy. However, when they are challenged in open discussion to to offer any other kind of model that comes from God's Word, there is silence. I need you to know that despite how you and I feel, there are patterns from God that are clearly understood and communicated from His Word. This morning's lesson is not to go into a massive academic exercise on patriarchy or the headship or leadership of the male, but the idea of a father. And so today we pay tribute to our fathers. We pay tribute to them regardless where they are and regardless who they are. We pay tribute to them and we thank them for what they have done for us. In the first place, we honor our fathers. We honor our parents. We know that from the Ten Commandments, we are commanded by God that the first commandment is to honor your father and your mother. Those same commandments are repeated twice in the New Testament. The one in Ephesians chapter 6 and the other one in Colossians chapter 3, where we are told, obey your parents. I need us to understand that these commands are unconditional. We are to love them, we are to obey them, and we are to honor them. And that means we need to pay them respect whether they are good or whether they are bad parents from our perspective. We need to honor them simply because they are our parents. And so often when one looks around us, we try to find ways and means that would justify our maybe having a bad feeling about our parents because of whatever or they have done or neglected to do for us. Scripture is very clear that we need to honor those where honor is due. Romans chapter 13 and verse 7 is another one of those passages where Paul tells the church that you need to honor and respect those governmental leaders that give their time to ruling. In our context in this country, often it is hard, but it is still the will of God that we honor them. 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 17 says, Show proper respect to everyone. Love the brotherhood of believers. Fear God. Honor the king. We find also that Peter wrote to the church, and he speaks to them not within a a political vacuum. He's speaking to a church that is being persecuted by Nero, and Nero was a bad, bad ruler. He persecuted the innocent, but despite that, he believes that you need to honor the rulers. You will find a similar discussion with Paul where Paul stands in the Sanhedrin, and I think it's in Acts chapter 23, he speaks disrespectfully to a high priest. 
And one of the men shouts and says, smack him on his mouth. And Paul turns around a theological giant and he throws scripture after scripture at these men and says, how dare you speak to me that way? And one man says to him, this man is your high priest. And you watch how Paul draws himself back in humility and he quotes God's scripture that says, thou shalt not speak ill of your rulers. Now, the reason I'm touching on these passages of Scripture is because sometimes we speak disparagingly about those who serve and those who rule, me included. And this passage checks me in my mouth and says, watch what you say. These passages says that you need to honor God. You need to honor those who are in authority over you. Am I by default saying that our parents have not made mistakes or that our fathers weren't great dads as they could have been? No, that's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying this morning is for us to focus not on celebrating their mistakes or even raising them, but saying that we honor them because they are parents. They are my father and they are my mother. We must get past ourselves that people are imperfect, but for Christ. And every one of us, when we became Christians, weren't perfect people, and neither were our parents. I'd like for us to look at three ways that we can honor our parents this morning, tomorrow and even the weeks that are following that are coming up in the weeks ahead. But before we do that, I want to play a video clip for you that you will look at the behavior of a young man as he treats his father. And I want you to know something, that all of us will be older one day, and the day will come when your strength will weaken. But I want you to listen to the dialogue between the two. It's a, and a, let me play the clip so that you can see. There are times when a parent will ask you to assist and to take care of them. And the reality of the matter is that our parents do get older and they will get weaker. And they may even ask the same question over and over again. And they may even sound irritating to you that you find them a nuisance to you. But I'm going to give you three distinct reasons and ways that you can honor your father. This morning, the first one is you can honor them by spending time with them. You see, first and foremost, the measure of the value you put on someone is not the kind of toys that you give them to amuse them, to replace you, but the time that you and I spend with them specifically. The time that you value them, the time that you say, I'm going to spend time with you once a week. When my mom, before my mom died, I spent once a week with her, four hours every Friday. I cooked lunch for her. I did her shopping for her. I used to take her favorite treat for her. And one day my mom asked me, she says, why do you do this? And she made a comment about my sister. And I says, I'm not in the comparative game. But God requires me to honor you. And I says, the day will come, Mom, that you will pass on. I refuse to live a life of regrets. You see, brethren, visiting Mom and Dad once a year does not constitute love. Maybe you feel that you, your time is so precious that you become so busy and so important. And maybe today your time of billing is maybe whatever it might be, and that might impress you, but it does not impress me nor your parents, neither does it impress God. The idea of honoring your parents is an age-long example and an instruction. The second one is communicating with your father. Every person can send a card and send an email once a year to a father. But there is something seriously wrong with your and my thinking 
when you feel that being kind or speaking to your father and your mother is, can be replaced by something else. Proverbs chapter 3 verse 27 tells you, do not withhold good from those who deserve it when it is in your power to act. It is within your power to visit with your father. It is within your power to give him good gifts and kindness and communicate and speak face to face with them. It is only at moments when you realize that they are not there that you realize I could have done better. Let me say this to you, honoring your father and your mother does not constitute replacing him with an expensive coffin or with filling this building with flowers. That's not honoring parents. That's part of your duty. But giving them those kind of flowers and gifts when they're alive is what God is talking about. God is into relationships. He's into speaking with His children. In the same way Jesus earnestly desired to speak with His Father and speak to Him daily before He appointed His disciples, He prayed all night. In the third place, you must not abandon your parents or your father. Did you know at the Durbanville Old Age Home, I visited with a few older folk in the church and they'd passed on now. And one particular day, there was a lady that was sitting in the foyer and I sat down with her and I said, how are you doing? And she said, what's your name? And I told her my name. She said to me, do you know this year you're the first person that visited their parents that greeted me. I said, I'm, I'm really sorry. I've been here a few times, and I have not greeted you before. She says, no, that's fine, but you've greeted me now. And she says, can I tell you something? My children had not visited with me for over a year. But then let me say this to you. I've watched old at homes, and I've been out of them more times than I care to remember. But you know what, brethren? It's a shame that sometimes they've become dumping ground for children, where we just leave them and neglect them. And so today, maybe you're asking yourself the question, how can I be kind to someone? I want to encourage you, even if today you haven't got a mother or a father, maybe what you need to do is go to pick and pay or go to Chickas or Woolworths, buy a few bunches of flowers, and just go to the closest old age home and give it to someone. It'll mean the world to them to show them kindness. At some time, they could take care of their children, but today they're excess baggage and a nuisance. The Bible warns us, and this comes from my heart because I feel so seriously about this text. But let me say this, there are parts side of my life that you will never be privy to. But the Bible speaks to us as believers. And he says to you and I, if you believe me, if you trust me, if you have obeyed me by obeying the gospel, you must do what I tell you. Paul warns the church in 1 Timothy 5, 8, that if anyone does not provide for his relatives and especially for his immediate family, he is denied the faith and is worse than an unbeliever. And what Paul is saying that no matter how much religiosity you try to display to the world, but if you do not take care of those with whom God has entrusted us, we are worse than unbelievers. It's not our, the government's responsibility or the church to take care of my mother or my father. It is ours. It is your responsibility to look after them. Listen to what Timothy says. If a widow has children or grandchildren, these should learn, first of all, to put their religion into practice by caring for their own family and so repaying their parents and grandparents, for this is pleasing to God. This cannot be shirked. It cannot be delegated. It must be embraced. There is a responsibility that occurs when your parents become weaker and their income stream has diminished to almost nothing, that God will bless you with an income stream strong enough to take care of them too. The roles then will be switched. The fourth way that you can honor your parents is by the way that you live. 
The way that you live is such an important thing to your parents. Solomon would say a good name is more desirable than great riches. To be esteemed is better than silver or gold. And what he's saying is to have good character and a good reputation is more important than all the money that people can amass. I want to say this, and I'm going to go a step further. Many years ago, a young man, I confronted him because of sin in his life. And he made a funny comment, and he says, Uncle D, can I ask you a question? I said, yeah. How much do you earn per month? I said, that's kind of personal, but do you really want to know? He said, yes. He says, I'll tell you. And he says, can I tell you how much I earned last month? He says, if you feel the necessity, you need to do that. And he told me. It was about four times, five times what I made in gross. He netted. And I said to him, can I tell you what my impression is of you? You're a rich scumbag. That's all you are. That's all you are. The Bible tells me that it is better to have a good name and a good reputation than to have all the riches of this world. Jesus Christ said to me that if a man gets rid of all the kind of stuff and embraces him, he will give him honor beyond what this world can give. And so often the world will tempt you and it will drive you and it will pull you in directions to try and make a name for yourself. Rather let go of those things. The gentleman phoned me the next day in tears. He said, I need to speak to you. I need to ask you to pray for me. And I need to help, ask you to help me that I can reconcile with my father. I said I would gladly do it. Before his father died, I met with him and his dad. And he said to his father, I want to beg your forgiveness for being so arrogant and being such a fool to think that value is attached to income stream. You see, brethren, until you make that full equation in your heart, you will realize that God views you differently. I'm going to give you an A, B, C, D, E just of being a good parent. But before that, I want you quickly just to watch a clip with me. To our fathers, about being a courageous leader, you must remember that the world has a different view of what it is to be a good leader, very different to what God has. Many times we think that if I can scream and shout, manipulate people with money and get them to do what I tell them, that you're a leader, oh no. Leader in God's kingdom is character-based. Leader in God's kingdom is based on who you are, not in the sight of what people think you are, but what you know and what, what your heart is exposed to God. I'm going to give you A, B, C, D, E of parenting this morning. And the first one is, I'm going to speak to us as fathers, that you overcome your fear of being a poor and a weak leader to being one that is an exceptional one in the following ways. The first one is to accept your children unconditionally. To love them for who they are. To not try to make your children to be like other people's children. You will find that your child excels in different areas. And so often we want our children to be what they'll never be. I was talking to a few children in preparation for this lesson. And the one child said to me, I've got to go to this lesson and that lesson. I've got to attend this thing and that thing. And the child says, I just don't want to do it. But my mom and my dad forces me to do that. Since when is it? that we do things the way that the world does it. You must remember that so often we force our children because the world demands it of us. And so we create busy children and not fulfilled children. Fathers, I want you to understand that you need to be very closely connected with your children. Find out how you can develop their personality to become independent thinking, biblically worldview thinking people. In the second place, I want to encourage you to teach your children to be benevolent. 
And to be benevolent brethren mean that we teach them to reach out to others. I praise God daily for serving in a congregation where benevolence is high on our agenda. Yes, we give to the poor. Yes, we take care of them. Yes, we do go out and we take blankets. Where babies are in shelters, we take them food. We take them clothing so that they can be warm. Yes, it is right. And that is what we teach our children. Jesus Christ says, I am among you as one who serves. I came into the world to serve, not to be served. And Jesus says, as often as you do it to the least of these, you've done it to me. And Jesus says, and asks the question, do you want to be great? Jesus says, you've come to the right place. Because you can be great in the church. But then you must be the servant of all. You must want to serve. You must want to be the one to lift people higher than you are. You need to remember that God wants them to be different. You know, I spoke to a gentleman the other day, and he said to me, Derek, you believe we can change this country? I said, absolutely, I believe it in the core of my being. I do. How are we going to do it? Is by teaching the poor about Jesus. Let me say this to you, brethren. There's no money or glory among the poor. But I want to say this to you. I challenge you to read every passage about Jesus' coming. Jesus' prophecy in Luke, he speaks, he says, I've come to the poor for them. I challenge you to read the life of Jesus. He became poor so that we may become rich. If you can reach the heart of a poor person, you can change and flip this country right side up. But it will need to have a will that is stronger than yours. In the third place, the C stands for consistency. Fathers, do not exasperate your children. Do not provoke your children. A man's notes that I have been access to is called John Fontenoy. And he writes in his class on the book of Ephesians, he says the following. And he always ended this, this particular segment of his class to the church, to the students. And he says to him, what do you expect from a boss? What frustrates you about your boss? And they say the following is, he constantly changes his mind. His uncertainty in leading. His unclear assignments. His unrealistic expectations. He gives us a job without clear instructions or even the resources to accomplish the task. And his lack of encouragement John Fontenoy would say that a father who has a clear and consistent lifestyle that provides necessary support in accomplishing the child task and gives the help that is needed is a man that does not frustrate his children. D, how can I be, sorry, how can I be consistent? And I'm going to give you three areas. The first one, you need to be consistent in your spiritual faithfulness. And yes, one of the measures is by being at worship twice on a Sunday and being at Bible study on a Wednesday night. You see, how can you lead and develop a biblical worldview when what you're doing on a Wednesday night or on a Sunday night is watching television? You cannot develop a biblical worldview. Brethren, sometimes it shocks me that we want to be leaders, but we feel that it is optional. In the second place, you must be consistent in personal responsibility. You must remember a child will respect you when you admit your mistakes, that you don't hide your failures or run from your mistakes. James says, confess your faults to one another and pray for one another. In the third place, we must be consistent in our personal integrity and in our moral purity. Job makes a comment and says, I've made a covenant with my eyes not to look lustfully at a woman. Paul says, we are not to be drunk on wine, but we must be led by the Spirit of God. D stands for discipline. And no, it does not mean that you need to discipline your child. It means that you are a self-disciplined individual. When you deal with your children, you don't discipline them out of anger. 
You don't discipline them because someone else has brought their, their, their disobedience to your attention. You correct your child because you love them. Because you have seen it, and that's a moment that you can draw closer to your child and give him that teaching moment that he needs to be at. We talk about discipleship within the church. Discipleship, brethren, does not start in the church. It starts in the home. When you engage your child, you don't run away or try to justify his or her deliberate sin, but you step into their lives and guide them. E stands for example. Be an example to your child. Watch your children, and they will accentuate your weaknesses. In other words, if I behave, my, behave in such a way that is positive, I would impact my child even more. I'm going to just read a few, few thoughts. I read this, and it really got me close to tears. Daddy, when you thought I was not looking, I heard you say a prayer, and I learned to trust in God. When you thought I was not looking, Dad, I saw you give up your time, energy, and money to help those who had nothing, and I learned to share. Dad, when you were not looking, I felt you kiss me goodnight, and I felt loved, and I felt safe. Dad, when I looked and saw how you hugged my mom, and hold her tight, and I knew that you loved her, and I wanted to have a husband like you. I wonder how many lessons we inadvertently teach our children. And I'm going to close off just with a poem, which says, Walk a little slower, Daddy, said a little child so small. I am following in your footsteps, and I don't want to fall. Sometimes your steps are very fast. Sometimes they are hard to see. So walk a little slower, Daddy, for you are leading me. Someday when I'm all grown up, you what I want to be. Then I'll have a little child who wants to follow me. And I want to lead just right and know that I was true. So walk a little slower, Daddy, for I must follow you. And the last aspect of this morning's lesson is forgiveness. Teach your children to forgive. Can I say this to you, brethren? I have watched in so many examples in this world that so many times our children are unforgiving because they've listened to you, how you speak disparagingly about your parents. And I've watched our children repeat the same behavior in their lives. Teach your children to forgive. Honor your father, and your mother. And I know for a fact that God, when He works with you and I, and as you walk closer to the cross, you become more courageous, that you do not listen to the counsel of the fearful, but you listen to the counsel of the just and of the righteous.